let's go live. So thanks everyone from wherever you are. Um, the CNO is gonna start putting out like a bi-monthly webinar, the Center for Neural Occlusion. And today we have with us Dr. Marcelo Matos. He's a oral maxillofacial radiologist out of Brazil. He's a CNO board member, and he does some really amazing things that I want uh, people to know about. And, you know, we, the CNO is all about measuring things. It's all about putting numbers to things. So those of us that practice dental medicine, you know, a lot of times when it comes to bites, we're, we're not really good about putting numbers to things. And we were good scientists back in college. Once we hit the clinic in dental school, I think a lot of us kind of lost our way and it wasn't our fault. So the whole point of the CNO is to kind of get things back in gear again. And I'm going to share a very short slideshow and then we're going to have Marcelo come on. But I want to give you guys a quick introduction to what we're doing here. So, and excuse this organization. All right, for the Center for Neural Occlusion, the motto and the CNO is measured matters for obvious reasons, right? Our mantra is proper diagnosis must always precede responsible treatment. We're trying to get guys and gals to put numbers to things before they jump into treating patients. They have to give them a list of potential diagnoses and know what they're doing and be able to back it with reproducible metrics. And the purpose of the CNO is to protect the patient, first and foremost. And for the dentists out there, this gets you insurance independence because if you can do this stuff, you can pull away from the insurance companies. People will pay for this after they realize what you're doing. So basically, how do we measure the occlusion? How do we measure the human bite? We can do so digitally, but most of us don't. So, and I want to make something really clear from the get-go. The joints, there are two TMJs and then there's the bite, okay? The joints are two thirds of the human bite. We need to be able to measure the joints as well as the bite. So today's webinar is gonna focus on digital occlusal analysis. We're gonna be measuring how the teeth come together very objectively. And Marcel and I are gonna talk about how we got into this years ago in our own respective worlds, which happened to merge together. And this is our commonality, the fact that we both believe in uh, measured matters. And I wanna point out also that, you know, when someone says my patient has TMJ, that's like saying my patient has wrist. TMJ is simply anatomy. So we need to remember that. And we can measure with CT and MRI and other metrics what's going on with the orthopedic joints themselves. And I need to point this out briefly. The articulating paper that we all use is 12 to 38% accurate relative to force and time. That is in the scientific literature. It's analog, it's not reproducible, and there is no record. Okay, and there's some of the papers that you can look up. You're welcome to freeze this at some point if you watch it again. And it will also be archived on the CNO public uh, Facebook page. Center for Neural Occlusion. There's a page there for the CNO. And this is a quick look at the T-Scan, the digital occlusal analysis hardware, which links to software, which we can have a record of. It is objective and reproducible. And it happens to be 95% accurate in force and time. And I also need to, in closing, mention that Marcelo is a very big part of our teaching curriculum. The CNO network um, consists of a bunch of specialists and GPs who are trying to get this word out there for people to understand that measure does matter and we can put numbers to things. And Marcelo has a very unique take on this, given that he's an oral maxillofacial radiologist who's also a clinician. They have a TMJ specialty in Brazil, and he's one of the best of them down there. So we have something called CNO4 that Marcelo runs up here in, at CNO headquarters in Rogers, Arkansas. And CNO4 is the most amazing course we have ever put on. I mean, all of it's amazing, but this one is like way above most people's head. This does not exist in South America. All right, and lastly, I need to mention the CNO Scientific Symposium. For those of you who might be interested in some of this during the COVID time, there's 25 credit hours out there for US docs. And basically there's people like Marcelo, Terry Alford, myself, uh, Dr. Ed Zibovitz, and many, many others. We, John Radke is in there, uh, 25 credit hours for cheap. It's like 500 bucks and there's an online exam that you all can take. And Marcelo's in that uh, several times. His mentor, Jorge Loretta is also in the symposium. So this is a very, this would be a really good idea. And lastly, cnotmj.com. That's where you can find the sign up for the symposium or any of the CNO curriculum. And now I would like to take the time to thank you, Marcelo, for being here. And please take it from here, Marcelo. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. It's an honor. And thanks, Nick, for the invitation. 
And we were earlier talking about a little bit about how we got into a T-scan, into measured occlusion. Uh, I'm about to tell you a little bit about my story, if you allowed me to. Uh, but tell a little bit about your story of T-scan, Nick. T-scan? Uh, it was probably 2007. I got into Sarah CAD CAM, and I was really good at it. Uh, jumped into it headfirst, loved it. I was tired of the labs giving me subjective, you know, prosthetics and contacts being off, occlusion being off. So I started searching for something digital and reproducible and I ran into T-Scan. And along the way, I bumped into Robert Kirstein and others and I started basically, it changed my practice. And I'm a general dentist, okay? I'm doing bread and butter stuff, everyday things. And it, I use it to this day. Today I work for about half a day and I use it three times. I use it on my normal patient pool. But along the way, I wound up publishing something I thought I would never do. And I'm a busy guy. So it's kind of hard for someone like me to do that. But, and over the years, it morphed into the CNO. But Marcelo, I heard that you have a, a much more interesting story. You started when you were a kid. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Actually, uh, I got involved with the T-Scan in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> and people may try to guess my age there, <laughs> make the, uh, count the years. <laughs> Oh, I was not even a teenager, I think. <laughs> so mom and dad brought it home, right? Long story short, my mother is a dentist. She is a dentist. She's a radiologist. In Brazil, we have this specialty, uh, oral and maxillofacial radiology. And my father's engineer. So every time there was a dental meeting, uh, and my father and my, and my mother was there, my mother had to... The, the opportunity to enjoy all the scientific part of the meeting, while my father, as engineer, loved to go to the booth and check all the technology that was there. So, one time they were in Salt Lake City, and I think in, this was in 1994, and my father just uh, got his eye on the T-scan, and as an engineer, he found that was fantastic. He, he was amazed of that technology. So to people there have, uh, have an idea, I'm he bought that same equipment, took it to Brazil, brought it to Brazil, and that was the version that T-Scan was a DOS version. Before we... <laughs> and I remember so playing around with that, that equipment. And... <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask people to, to close their mic. Please, there's a, a, a background noise. And if there's, I, I'm gonna have some, some moment for, for some questions. Just, just hit the microphone, open it, and that's it. But, anyways, back to the story. So, I was playing around with T scan, and actually, there are two great passions in my life since little kid martial arts. And TMG. <laughs> so I got into uh, college. I went to the dentist school. I was always involved with TMG since day one in the, in the, in the, in the dentist school. And I used to go to dental meeting just to, to, to listen. Great names talking about TMG. So I was always playing with T-Scan. And one thing that T-Scan is very uh, good at is to show that many theories, when you're gonna measure it, it's a, a little bit different. For example, I remember day I was in the, in, the, in the classroom and the teacher, the, the professor, he said, okay, this is a centric occlusion. The centric occlusion is at that time when the, the, the teeth doing occlusion, the maximum intercuspidation is in the same position as the centric relation. That was what he was saying that time. And I remember grab the T-scan a few days later at my mother's office, bite, and see that the ma maximum intercuspidation was just a split moment during the whole process of occlusion. It was not a static position. And that I, I said, whoa, that's different. <laughs> that's not the same way that theory are being taught to us. And that, of course, that, that got me into trouble in the dental school. And I remember researching uh, Dr. Kerstin papers to, to back me up against the professor. <laughs> they didn't want to hear about that. 
So uh, I remember I remember one of the first papers I, I had access. That time there was no access online uh, such as PubMed we have now. So we need to order at the the how to call that the bibliotecaria. Bibliot I don't know how to call that in English. We go to the the, the, the like special part of the library. 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 Yeah. Okay. With the library, I had to order the, the, the annual reference book, order reference, order papers, papers. So that was that time. And I remember reading Dr. Kasten's paper about the center of force. That's now a, a very classical feature of the T-scan. And using that to, to discuss with my professor there. So that was my beginning with TSCAN. Then I graduated and I knew that TSCAN could connect to a electromyography unit. And at that time I was doing a post-graduation in orofacial pain here. And here in Brazil we have the specialty in orofacial pain and temporomandibular disorder as a specialty actually in dentistry. In dentistry. So I, I had this teacher, uh, this professor talking about how the muscle uh, pain appear to, to uh, how the patient refers to the muscle pain or to the articular pain, but they were not measuring. So I remember leaving the class at night, it was a, a, a night uh, course, and I decided the other day to, to buy the, the EMG. And this, uh, this was already in 2002. I, I think it was the end of, 2002. I bought the EMG 2003, February 2003. The equipment arrived here in Brazil and I said, whoa, what do I do with that? <laughs> so I called Bar Research and I tried to access the uh, professional called Harold Gale. Most of you have know about him. I went to talk to him because I knew because of his book, I had, I had read his book earlier in, in dental school and I knew he had some, there's a chapter in the, in the book about T-scan with the DOS version and posture. The, the book's called The Cranial Mandibular uh, uh, Management of Cranial Mandibular Disorders, I think it's that. Mm -hmm. So I tried to, through T-scan, get in contact to Gail so I could find someone that was using this kind of technology and maybe learn from that person. But I didn't know by that by then, but I was talking to John Radick, <laughs> Barry Sush, uh, John president. Radke. John Radke. Radke. Yep. And yep. actually, he told me, okay, you don't need to come by to the United States. You, have, you, you can look for uh, this professional professor in Argentina, Dr. Loretta. So I met Dr. Loretta, who came to be my mentor in this field in 2003. And since then, I've been working exclusively with TMJ pathology, and of course, as a consequence, with occlusion. And that's my story. <laughs> From the day one, before it, <laughs> day three, and, uh, and before college, after college, and so on. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's the story. Yeah, you know, interesting that you've been in this since you were a kid. I mean, you've had this in your head for, what, 25 plus years, 30 years now, right? So... You know, this is back when it was new and something different, something that would be on a, a popular science uh, news cover or something. This was, I think the T-scan originated about, what, 1989, correct? So you were in it like 94, is that right? 1984, the T-scan was built. Okay, well, there you go. See, there's Robert for us. <laughs> oh, nice dude. He'll to correct us. Here, <laughs> I didn't mean 1994, my... My father was in Salt Lake City, and Tiscan had a booth there. Uh, okay. Hey, Robert, you want to say something real quick? Well, just that, you know, Tiscan began in 1983, 1984. And, um, and um, of course, Marcelo got into it with his parents when it was Tiscan 1. So. Back in the DOS days, right? Now, um, Dr. Manis, who was the the founder of it with the MIT engineers, Rob Podloff and his team, uh, Bobrick and Golden, they, um, they created the first sensor that measured time and force. And that's what 
you know, we began to use then. And of course, Marcelo was, was young compared to me, but he still was interested in it. So that's a really fascinating thing. So just good luck, Marcelo, today. I'm grateful that you're talking about the T-scan with Nick and I'll now mute myself, okay? You know, a moment that was amazing, 2017, or, or maybe 2016, no, 2016, I think, in a meeting in Bar Research, I had the opportunity for the first time to meet Dr. Robert Kirsten, and it was an honor. <laughs> I remember to toast about the, with him about this story. Remember that, Robert? Yep. I think we, had, we were having a dinner or something like that. It was amazing, amazing. You're talking about the dinner where Piper was there and the rest, or? I think it was so 2017, if I'm not sure. Yeah, it all blends when, together. I'm getting old. There's a lot of great. It was here. when you spoke. It was when Marcelo spoke that we, um, and everyone was fascinated with the presentation because the joint rehabilitation and the approach to looking at serum in the joints and looking at the breakdown of the condyle biologically and, and, and with, with fluids was a unique approach and everyone was marveling at it. That's, that's the year that we met Marcelo. Yes, yes, I think it was 2017, if, if I'm sure, if uh -huh. I'm correct. Yeah. Well, uh, anyways, you know what is amazing all that, uh, your work with T-Scan uh, allows us to understand teeth from a different perspective. For, for a long time, dentistry had looked to, to, to the teeth as part of the skeleton that is just out of the body, right? You have all the bone inside, and the only part that's outside is the teeth. But actually, if you think about embryology and evolution, the teeth come from the ectoderm, and all the skeleton, the bone, come from mesoderm. You know what more comes from ectoderm? The central neuroses, the nerves. All the nerves come from there. So actually, if you think about the way evolution has treated the, 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 the beginning of the development of jaw and teeth, we, we end up understanding that the teeth actually is a peripheral nerve ending surrounded by a mineral that we call teeth or tooth. So TSCAN allows us to check the, the bite in the teeth as a sensory organ. It's not just like uh, you're playing with balls and the balls hit each other and change. You know how that, I don't know how to call that name in English. You have the, the uh, like a, a, a baton and you hit the balls to get into, it's a game, I, I cannot, Golf, the, golf, or basketball. Golf. No, 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 on a table, on a green table, with a lot of- Oh, pool, ball. pool. This, yes. Billiards. One, one ball hits the others and it starts to move all around. The teeth is not like that. Not, you touch this teeth and just move because you hit one teeth. No, you touch the teeth, the teeth are sensory organ, inform the central nervous system and fire muscle to correct that trajectory. So we have the, the, the teeth connected to the neuromotor functions. And this can actually give us direct access to that information. And that is amazing. We can look to the teeth as a sensory organ. Actually, the teeth are the most sensitive uh, neurological sensor in the body. The only thing that's very, very similar, probably, at the same level as the teeth is the iris of the eyes and this uh, uh, short ciliar muscle that moves it. To have an idea, you know, a hair, uh, just uh, this one piece of hair measure about 60 micras, mic micros, as you say in English. Well, a micron is some, that's a, a, it is a one millimeter divided by 1,000. If just a piece of hair stays between two teeth, it bothers. And we can note it very quickly. What other part of the body can detect such a small change 
in surface in measurement as this, just the eyes. So the teeth is, uh, are a very, very sensible sensory receptor from the neurological system. And it's very easy when we look to do, from this perspective to understand that any change in this uh, complex we call occlusion going to have consequence in terms of motor function. Some consequence may not be pathological, but some may be pathological. And how to manipulate these sensory organs in order to make them give better information to the brainstem to have corrected neuromotor response through T-scan. You can use another technology. You can combine T-scan with EMG. I, like, I, like, I love to combine T-scan with jaw tracking. I, I, I showed that in my last uh, conference in bar research. I have some cases here that can show that too. But anyways, the direct view of the teeth as a sensory organ, you go through T-scan and that gives us uh, a, a very nice opportunity to refine the occlusion that we create in people's mouth. People does, they, as a dentist, we do full mouth reconstruction, fields, cavity fields. We do cosmetic dentistry, dentistry. And we are doing this over the most sensitive sensory organ of the body. We don't always think, we are not always all the time thinking about that, right, Nick? That's right. But there yeah. lies all those, or at, may, at least many failures of dental work. We, we create a teeth, very beautiful, but it, it is not aligned with the needs of that jaw teeth complex. And gonna be like a, a foreign body there. It gonna be worked out or gonna break or something like that. Look, I, I do this uh, as a general practitioner and I can tell you that it's made me more efficient I've had fewer recalls over the last 12 to 15 years since I've been using it. Um, it helps me with TMD world on occasion. It's always a part of my workup when I do the neuro occlusion screening on people. You know, it's one of the many tools that we use, including CT and MRI and JVA and EMG and mastication, et cetera. You know, when you can put numbers to something, you can reproduce it and you see patterns and there's research to back it. It changes the way you practice dentistry and it changes the way the patients perceive you. And it changes your outcomes. Your efficacy is improved. It's the bottom line. I mean, it's the future. It's kind of like using the normal ink ribbon is akin to a typewriter. I would say it's already the future. Software. It, it is, is the, the present. <laughs> Actually, it's the past, but most people have never. That's even, true. Yeah. Yeah. Like Robert said a few minutes ago, 1984. I mean, good God. I was in high school then. And I'm old now. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's many dentists have completed a, comp a career in that time frame. And they've never even been introduced to the concept. The bottom line is they, they just don't know. They, and that's okay. They weren't aware. But we need to start knocking on some doors and get more and more people aware of these uh, metrics that we can use. And it's not that hard to learn. Yeah, sometimes I, I, I see that people are like, uh, not everybody, uh, but many dentists are like trapped in that old fighting uh, paradigm about does occlusion promotes TMD? or not. And I think that's the wrong way to see it. Uh, recently, we had uh, uh, some paper published saying that, that occlusion relation to TMD was over. And then I published it with Radic, Ben Sutter published also, and other dates published, showing that this kind of idea is actually inaccurate. It's incorrect. Why? Because they are both connected to each other through the neurological nervous system and from an orthopedic point of view. So bottom line, if you have something going on in the TMJ, let's say you got a punch to your, you got punched in the chin. Who has ever been punched to the chin? I have been sometimes doing martial arts spreads. And let's say the impact was not strong enough to have a fracture there, but strong enough to get some inflammation there. What happens to 
just after that. You gotta bite a little bit off. You can't close the same way you could close before because simply when you try to close and the condyle try to go further into the, the fossa, now it finds uh, inflammated tissue that limits the amount of distance that the condyle may travel in and backwards to, to, to the inner part of the fossa. And it makes you bite a little bit off. Well, thinking about, okay, in a case like that, after inflammation get resolved, you have your bite back. But thinking about some people that has disc displaced, joint degeneration, uh, and so on. This change in the orthopedic position of the jaw is going to change the occlusion. And if someone has, for example, um, an autoimmune temporomandibular arthropathy, maybe this changing is going to stay happening over time. And depending on velocity, you'll never have a stable occlusion. That's where understanding from pathological point of view, in terms of temporomandibular pathology, helps you select which patient treats the occlusion and which patient should not treat the occlusion as in, in first place. Maybe we have to stabilize the joint first, then work on occlusion. But the opposite is also true. Sometimes we manipulate the occlusion of the patient, thinking about a person who has own form, that implants, prosthodontics, but the position that the dentist elects to rehab that patient maybe is not aligned with the needs of the joint and the muscle. Sometimes the patient is uh, almost uh, flat on the dental chair, looking to the ceiling. The mandible is too much backwards, and the dentist is manipulating by the position. And sometimes. Oh, say. Dr. Kersey, want to say something? Say it. Oh, okay. So, anytime we as a dentist manipulate the, the, the occlusion, we may promote a position that, from a biomechanical and a neurological point of view, is not that good for that person. And technology such as T scan helps us better manage this case. With T-scan, you can, for example, uh, correct the COF trajectory. You see that the, the, the occlusion is starting at a certain point, let's say the right back teeth, and then going to the front of, uh, from, from to the incisor, the, then back to the same side back teeth, and then to the left. Okay, this is, this is not a good way to close. Why? Because all these sensory organs called teeth are gonna be telling those messages, those messages to the brainstem that gonna fire, for example, temporalis in different uh, moments just to get the mouth closed. In the long run, the patient starts to have problems with the temporary, uh, temporalis tendon, temporalis tendonites, muscle pain, and so on. So every time we manipulate sensors, we have to use the correct tools to measure it. Does that make, make sense to you, Nick? Of course it does. Yeah, and you know, the electromyography lets us do that. So it, the research is there. I mean, it's just a matter of getting it out there. And that's the whole point. That's why we're putting things like this out there. We want other people to start thinking about this and starting to realize that it's not this esoteric thing that they can't use in practice. I, I'm a GP. I have a very, very busy practice. I am not insurance based. I am fee for service. And one of the main reasons I can do that in the United States of America is because I set myself apart with becoming more or less an expert at bites. You know, we say it all the time, teeth, gums, and bites. Dentists need to be experts at all three things. If we're not measuring objectively, we are not experts at bites. And that, like you said, that includes both joints and the teeth, the occlusion itself. So two thirds of the bite is the, are the orthopedic TMJs, but that other third is extremely important too. You have to be able to measure all three points. Joint, joint teeth, like we say in the CNO, joint, joint teeth. So 
Yeah, uh, I found a picture today. Actually, I found a piece of the tea scan I have, and I took a picture earlier today. Let me let me share with you. This was the T scan two that I, when I updated the T scan, I think it was around 2002 or 2003 when I was about to buy the EMG. And as you can see, it is not USB. It is print porter. <laughs> and this was the updated version I had. I took this picture today. I found this in a box. <laughs> what year was this? What? When you when you acquired this uh this handle, what year was that? The this handle was probably around 2002 or 2003, something like that. When uh we upgraded the 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 the, the Tiscan unit we had. <laughs> Very good. Interesting, right? How, how I was looking for some some recorders, old records, but I couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. <laughs> how many how many handles do you have in your practice? T scan uh, the hardware. This two. I have two. Four. But right now, right now, last year, uh, my T scan broke, and yep. I didn't have a uh, repair right now. So since I was thinking about get one, the beginning of this year, then came the pandemic and all. Shut down. Yeah. But my two my two handles are now broken. Oh man. <laughs> They're sending those in. <laughs> Something that's gonna you know, gonna be solved. Yeah. By the end of the, the, the this craziness we are living. Well, I have I have yeah. a Novus and I have three of the Evo handles, so I have four total, and they all get used every day. You know, so. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, we say probably twenty or so patients on a daily basis. There's times where we'll even use the T-scan and hygiene, you know, so it depends. Let's say we did a crown on them six months ago and they've got a little bit of a cold sensitivity issue. That's not too bad. We pull the T-scan in, we take a burr, we swipe it, we knock out the FDH and they're gone and they're happy, you know, for example, you know, so it's, it's ubiquitous. It's something that we use literally every day. Top 10 things I cannot practice without. For sure. So, uh, get a piece of what we were talking about, sensitive tea. Yeah, the aluminium. How amazing is when you adjust or refine the occlusion, and when you have the proper distribution of force and, from a neurologic point of view, a nice messaging from the occlusion to the brainstem. What happens just after that? The patient that is code sensitive is no code sensitive anymore, right? Or yeah. much less. And we are back to the idea, teeth as a sensory organ. Mm -hmm. And it goes further than that because as a sensory, sensory, sensory organs, it does has an impact on the head position. The same way as the eye and the same way as the, the labyrinth, the, the vestibular system, but at different intensity, of course. And that puts the jaw in the middle of the balance control, something that has to do actually together with all these with the upper airway. Why? Because as, as primates, we became over two feet, so we bend the airway and the airway started to, to be trapped between the tongue, the space, given by the jaw, which is profoundly influenced by the status of the CMJ. For example, if you have a CMJ that was damaged uh, early in life, we have a, a growth center that is compromised. So that minimum is going to be smaller. If everybody who is following us here, I want you to understand a little bit more about this, Go to the CNO symposium. Well, uh, I have two conferences there. One talking about open bites in class two, I think. And you're gonna see how many cases of class two uh, skeletal pattern actually are patient, not class two because their father or mother was class two, but class two because they has a HMJ pathology or a HMJ damage that prevent that mango to grow. The collateral effect of that, besides 
but the possibility of pain and headache and all that is that you have less space for the tongue in the airway. You're going to be trapped between the tongue and the, the spine. And we're going to try to survive breathing through that. And if we're going to change the position of the head to respect the airflow. Mm -hmm. And the teeth are going to be part of the sensory organs that are going to give information to the brainstem how to manage that position. And we're going to have J teeth and airway uh, impacting the posture, the way we stay straight against gravity. And that is simply amazing because we know where the teeth start, but we do not know where it ends. This is something that Dr. Garretta, my mentor, says all the time. The other thing is that, think about something. We are monkeys. We are primates evolved from the same primates that the monkeys evolved. At certain point in time, we split, we had a split, and then we, and then we took another direction, right? Okay. How does occlusion work in these other mammals? We don't think much about that, right? But be behind this question, there's something that we were talking this week in the CNO page on Facebook. And that, that was about worm teeth. When consider uh, the, 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 the damaged teeth like Brooks is pathological or not? Right, Nick? Yep. Is it pathology? Is it wear? Is it normal? You know, normal anthropology. Is yeah. You know, for a long, Brooks is most considered something pathological. But I think the first time I... I heard that bruxism could be something connected to uh, protection behavior of our body. I think it was in 2009, maybe, when I listened to Dr. Alan Moses, who works a lot with uh, upper uh, airways, and he could record in a case, a situation, uh, I, I don't recall perfectly how was the case, but uh, the bottom line was, he was saying maybe this patient is bruxing, trying to put the minimal forward to breathe. Maybe bruxes is an attempt to the body to help the patient, the, the, the patient breathe. And you know what? Later, some paper that was dealing with uh, oral applies for bruxism end up documenting that those splints from bruxism was making sleep up there worse and quality of sleep worse that means the dentist was trying to avoid the teeth the teeth damage through the splint but was getting the sleep apnea worse which is much worse they have bad teeth yeah. <laughs> because sleep apnea is connected to all kind of bad stuff one can imagine so the bottom line is why why that happens and there is something that Dr. Loretta likes to say, we are no longer Homo sapiens. We are more like Homo urbanus, we live in cities. If you go to a museum, such like British Natural History Museum, and look for the old time human beings, you're going to see that most of the time, there is no cuspids. It's all flat. Around 30 years old, all flat. So, I leave here a question. Was the teeth supposed to last a lifetime or was the lifetime that last why there was there were teeth? Yeah. You don't yeah. think too much about that, right? But from an evolutionary perspective, you are putting hard structure, the enamel, against each other. You do expect to wear that thing. So, how nature deal with that? Let me share something with you. Then there's the argument that the teeth do not occlude, right? Yeah, but, it, but let's think about something. When occlusion appeared in evolution, 
because when we are chewing, and that I posted in the senior page, can you all see that? Yep. This is a chewing analysis. And these, the, the green line are the vertical moving, movement of each striking of the chewing motion. The, the red one is anterior, posterior, and the yellow one is right and left movement. So we have 16 strikes against the almond. But as you can see, the teeth are getting together. Basically here, among 16 cycles, there is no teeth contact. Even here, the teeth actually are not completely in contact to each other because the occlusal threshold is 0.3 millimeters. You know what? There is some piece of food between the teeth. So how these teeth are worn? Worn out? Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Well, how are they worn out? Worn out. If they're not touching, at least doing chewing. Well, from this evolutionary point of view, we have actually most of the basic occlusion concepts do not come from dentistry, but, but from anthropology. In anthropology, we have, think about something. When, when Charles Darwin in late 800, appeared with the evolutionary theory, people start to laugh because people wouldn't say, okay, we are not, we are not monkeys. <laughs> we didn't vote for monkeys. Actually, you didn't vote for monkeys because the monkeys is a, a end product of evolution, such as we. But we had some ancestors in common. And there was this big running uh, looking for this common ancestor. And what archaeologists, would find during this searching bone and teeth. So once we start to study teeth from this perspective, it was no longer more something to, to, to only, you know, the story of the history of dentistry. Dentistry was done by people who, who cut hairs and had you, you give them a little bit of, uh, of alcohol and they also put, took a tooth out, right? It still happens well, in some places. <laughs> no, this is the story of us. Right? The, the physician evolved from the, 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 the surgery of the king, from the, the, the pharmacist that also evolved to the, the pharmacologist and, and, and so on. But we evolved from the, the, the guy who cut the, the hair, the, the beard, and, <laughs> and was able to take a, a, a tooth out when it, it was hurting. Much later, dentistry got into the university. And the reason it starts to become an academic issue, an academic subject, is because in medicine, actually in anthropology, we start to understand about how teeth work, to understand what kind of ancestors we had, what they ate, what they did, how they, they moved from a place to another. Bone and teeth was able to tell the story. So the, the, the concept of abrasion, erosion, and attrition comes from anthropology. For example, I, I think I have some, some slides here. Let me show this very quickly. We are about 40, 40 minutes now, so I don't know actually how long we have, but let, let me show this. As long as you want to go, Marcel. This is abrasion. By definition, from an anthropological point of view, this happens when we chew hard food full of impurities, as our ancestors did. The food has small stones, part of plants, and all stuff, uh, little bugs, uh, sand, everything there. So the food could have this abrasion over teeth, and the pattern from a microscope point of view, is like this. We have many directions of damage to enamel, to the enamel. The erosion, it's different. It just appeared when the human being left the, the, the hunting as the only source of food and start to become farmers. And we invented the, the fermented, drinks and fermented food 
And this is when we, uh, an archaeologist found teeth in an old population with erosion, he knew that was probably dealing with a person from the past that was living in a farm and was able to eat fermented uh, food and fermented drinks. What has uh, acidity? He hatched, he ate, and gave us this kind of stuff. Well, abrasion was physiological, was part of life. Erosion was something that culture started to give us. But attrition is different. You can see the, five, the, 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 the marks are all in the same direction because the teeth are being put against each other, always in the same direction, give the same kind of lines uh, in the process of wearing the teeth. So these only appeared much later, much later in human evolution. And when we talk about evolution, we must understand that occlusion was not part of it for a long time. Fish and reptiles has no occlusion. And there's some, something good about has have no occlusion. You don't need a very complex neurological teeth. You can have teeth that falls and breaks all the time and there is another line of teeth forming there, such as the sharks, such as the crocodile, alligators, and so on. They have teeth that is no trouble if he loses one because there's another one to come and replace the first one. But some moment in time, the reptiles who has this configuration evolved to these in the bones that was used to chew became what we call ear. It becomes our ear system. The articular, the angular, and the quadrate uh, bones became the inner bones of the ear. And the same process happens when we are talking about embryology. There was a point in, in the story of evolution of the species that was two joints to move the mandible. One over the mandible, the other over the ear. It was the transition moment. And this happens actually in the, in the baby at the fourth week of uh, interuterine life. That means that if you have ear and mandible come from the same arrangement for a while, you keep the same neurological pathway in those structures, and that is actually connected. The first movement of the jaw is over the cartilage of mecca and the something that's going to be the, the, the ear bone. So this small connection between these three bones allows mammals to hear sounds of a higher frequency than animals with a single bone in the middle ear. Bones originally used to chew by the reptiles have evolved to assist mammals in ability to hear. This is interesting because this changing everything. This allowed the mammals to evolve the occlusion. And once the occlusion evolved, we, we needed more neural information in order to make the teeth contact each other in a proper way. But also, it gave, it gave also a problem. The teeth cannot be anymore something that you can lose all the time because it became more complex, more differentiated. That's why, that's why in, uh, 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 I'll go back here. That's why you need to understand that. Many times we see this, right? A brookshism. Marcelo, you, a, your, your screen is not displayed. If you're trying to display the screen. Uh, you like when you were talking about the erosion abrasion. Oh, so was, you, I, I, I showed something that was missed. Let, let me go back. Yeah, go back to that so that we all can see, please. In the meantime. I was talking about these. I uh, don't know how, why that. Did you saw that? No, we did not. That was when I was talking about there was no occlusion in the past. Right. Occlusion was much later. Actually, occlusion 
occlusion or something that was possible only after uh, the, the, the only after jaw and ear became apart. So sharks, like many fish, crocodiles, like many reptiles, can replace teeth very easily. The teeth is not uh, so complex yeah. as in mammals. Yeah. No, we, we got all that. Just show us the images, if you would, real briefly, so you don't, you know. This, this were the image. Yeah, there the you go. The same yeah. bones that are used to chew evolved for a while with double jaw joints, and later it became the ear bones here. Yeah. And we yeah. replaced the first articulation to a second articulation. And during embryology, we have the same process. The first movement of the jaw in the fourth week is between the, the, the inner ear and the macular cartilage. Mm -hmm. And that was the, what I just read. This small connection between these three bones allows mammals to hear sounds of a higher frequency, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So we need more neurological control of the teeth. And that was the images of erosion, abrasion. It's those you saw, right? No, we did not. Oh, so this is abrasion. The abrasion from microscope point of view is like this, many direction of damage to, an, to anemia because this is for the food, the food full of sand and other impurities. Mm -hmm. But this is physiological. The nature was expecting that to, that to happen. This was, this was not physiological. This appeared after we start to have access to ferment that acid food and drink. And this is attrition. In attrition, you have teeth against another teeth changing and taking off piece of the enamel. You have all these risks to the same direction. Can you see that? Yep. It's not many yep. different directions as you see in abrasion. Attrition, right. like, okay. Would you mind going back to the erosion slide? And I'm gonna ask one of our guests, um, he's the co-author in one of the uh, textbook chapters or papers that I wrote, uh, Tom Coleman. Hey, Tom. Just one something, something before. This, this, in case, just for uh, illustration, right? Yeah. Actually, this kind of erosion comes from from throw up, from the, yeah. the, the, the stomach. It's not the erosion from the, right. the acid. Right, just real briefly, Tom, do you, out, can you have audio? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Why don't you tell us real quick, you and I have talks about this. Give us about two minutes on your take on erosion and all that. Sure. Uh, erosion is a physical mechanism, uh, such as beach erosion. I would uh, rather, uh, you know, it's a frictional mechanism. I would rather term this as bio-corrosion, which uh, is defined, has been defined, uh, in a 2012 paper is a chemical, biochemical, electrochemical, or protease action upon teeth. Uh, so uh, let's say if this is of uh, intrinsic or endogenous or exogenous biocorrosion, then we're looking at uh, a degradation on that level rather than frictional. So uh, uh, without getting it into it too deeply, uh, if you uh, see uh, lingual uh, of maxillary uh, teeth affected by biocorrosion, then you're looking more likely at endogenous biocorrosion whereas exogenous biocorrosion, that is uh, materials that come in from the external environment, which could be wine, could be uh, a pool, uh, could be a number of different sources, uh, you know, sulfuric uh, or hydrochloric acid in the environment, then uh, you're looking mostly at uh, uh, labial or buccal uh, tooth degradation. So it's an easy way to uh, kind of define what you're looking to investigate as the source of the uh, bio corrosion. Yeah, Marcelo, I wanted Tom to just pipe in real quick because he's truly an expert at this. He's been researching this for like 
20 years plus with John Grippo. So Great. a lot of us will make the mistake about the erosion. It's what we were taught, but Tom takes it to a whole nother level. So not, sure, that we're, sure. not that we're wrong. It's just our labels are a little bit out of kilter. So. Okay. okay. That has to do with uh, definitions uh, from the uh, prosthodontic uh, uh, groups. Uh, if you look at meteorology uh, versus uh, dentistry, uh, the, the terms of erosion should be the same, but they're not. Uh, the medical and dental uh, community, well, especially the dental community, not so much the uh, medical, but the dental community really hasn't come to grips with uh, many terms that have a direct relationship on our understanding of the mechanisms that affect degradation. Yeah, basically misnomers. Yes. We're mislabeling things. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you. Thanks for your time. And I'm sorry you, to you. interrupt for such a long time. Oh, no, no, great. No. no, thank you. Uh, well, that's why I, I, uh, I anticipated that. I, I knew that was from endogenous stuff, right? the lingual part of the teeth, but just to illustrate erosion. Anyway, from an evolutionary point of view, erosion was not very common in hunters, gator ancestors. You could see more abrasion and erosion and attrition, much less uh, uh, occurrence. The prevalence is much less, let us say. So this is attrition. This is what happens when you have teeth against teeth, tooth against tooth, frequently. But the other, the, the other thing that we have is posterior teeth with relatively no attrition and anterior teeth with a lot of wear. The question is, when we close the mouth, we, this is a children, right? But in many cases, we see, we see also the same in adults. But the, the, the question is, when we clench and bite in our back teeth, our frontal teeth are not in contact in general. So why all this wear is in the frontal teeth? It means that the, 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 person, the person is propulsing the mandible forward to do that. And why? And though it will go back to that airway stuff, the protection aspect of uh, survival mechanism and so on. So anyways, look to this. We know that canines, uh, wolves, uh, dogs, almost not have lateral movement, right? You know that. And have you ever wondered why? We usually think about the canines, right? With these big canines here, it cannot move laterally. Makes sense, right? Why am I showing this? Because most of the concepts that was taken from, from phylogenetics and anthropology was the base of the gynatology. Because when we say that canines is a, do a protection work of the back teeth and the, the canine guide, the anterior guide, all this that was very, very let's say, very studied in the 30s when the American Gynatological Society was uh, created. Actually, if you go to the papers, originally it came from analysis of mammal schools, herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, rodents. And those concepts have to do to the way we evolved to explore new, uh, to take advantage, advantage of new environments, source of nutrition. So take into account the carnivore. You cannot move laterally, and you usually think about canines, but actually the problem is not the canine. It's not the canine that blocks the lateral movement, but the back teeth, the back teeth. Because if this back teeth, and when a canine close the mouth, these cover this like a scissor, 
and that cannot allow lateral movement. What is interesting is when you go to an omnivore, like a bear, that comes from a carnivore evolution, you have big canines, but it can move laterally. Why? Because the back teeth are flat, like the herbivore. How about the mandrill with well, these big canines? It can move laterally, but know what? What happens if he mistake a bite? We may bite the tongue, we may bite the cheek, but what happens if a mandrill mistake a bite? He stabs himself, right? That imply that this kind of evolution to control the teeth in that manner need this. Some specimen kept canine developed like carnivore and more or less flattened like that of herbivores, which requires great neuromotor control, favoring the development of brain capacity to explore new sources of food and new environments with the improvement of communication and group work. But we follow beyond that and we just smashed our faces against our school creating a very complex problem to the airways. They always start to be trapped between these two structures. And that's where all this technology jumps in because it allows us to understand all this phenomena and control it in a clinical environment. And look about, uh, think about something. To a monkey like that, to move laterally the mandible, from a proprioceptive point of view, he, it must know perfectly where these teeth are located. If he starts to close them up quickly, and these just hit these in an uncontrolled manner, it's gonna be a trouble for this animal. So the motor, neuromotor evolution to control that required a much evolved brainstem and later the cortex. And these make teeth extremely connected to brain evolution. And that's very interesting because this, there is this, this, this scene from a very interesting author let me grab this thing here. I'm going to share that right now. I hope all can see. With all the predator powers of the joint teeth and the possibility of swift and accurate pursuit of prey, there would have been no evolution of the sense organs of smell, sight, and hearing of elaborate muscular coordination, of provision of how to get from here to there and the possible, possible consequence of the transit. In short, there would have been no centralization of the neural system, such as ultimately produce the brain and the earth would never have known the phenomenon of consciousness there, at least of an order superior to that of the lobster, scorpion, or butterfly. Homer and Smith, 1953. This is very profound, you know why? Because this connects all neurological aspect, biomechanical aspect, in a way that we can control only if we can read it. And in human studies, I didn't put any studies like that in here, in this presentation, but in human studies, there is a correlation between problem to chill and, and uh, early dementia. Can you imagine that? Why? Because the, the amount of information that the brain, the brainstem and the cortex have to process to control mandible, chewing, speaking, uh, and all these have to, to have sensors monitor the limits of movement, such as the teeth, the tongue, and so on. So it gives a a huge number of information to the brainstem and to the cortex, 
okay, the, the, all the central nervous system has to process, connect new neurons to make new synapses. And all this can be only controlled if we do properly our work. Because the evolution is the evolution. Just system that generally led the way uh, uh, in evolution, those that are not effective led to death. Only the improved one could survive in such a manner that jaw evolved very early in the evolution. You know, fourth week of inter uterine life, and we are already moving our minimum. And from the embryological point of view, we repeat what happened in evolution. And that being said, think about something. Oh, what is that? This slide. The only, only live being, being without jaws that could survive evolution was the lampreys. Every other lost the, comp the competitive aspect of evolution. So, if we put this in practical things, if we put this in practical things, we are dealing with a final end product of evolution. That is a nerve surrounded by mineral that we call tooth. And we just manipulate it all the time, thinking that nothing bad is gonna happen in our patient. And that is simply not true. If we just change the teeth in an uncontrolled way, it's gonna have impact on patient's life. Sometimes we don't see the impact because the patient is gonna be complaining about headache, not to the dentist, but to the physician, or to problem with posture, not to the dentist, but to the uh, physical therapist. Or maybe the patient comes back with a broken teeth that you just have a feeling a week ago, and you don't know how you could just use the best material available, the, the best adhesion system, and that work was not uh, good enough to last more than a few weeks. So, in practical terms, if you want to see some case, I can, I have two interesting cases. But I think we have gone too long in terms of time, right? So I have this case here. Let me share my screen. Unfortunately, it is in Portuguese. I hope I speak Portuguese there. <laughs> but take a look at this case. She had headaches for over six years autoimmune thyroiditis and a lot of problems from a system point of view. She had people in her family with autoimmune problem. She had a history of car accident and so on. From a, a clinical point of view, this represents her pain in a scale that the higher number would be 100. She is almost 80 percent in pain in this column at the left. And this is spontaneous pain. Well, that was her occlusion condition. That was her change day condition. And this is a deformed condyle. Dr. Loretta and Dr. Steven Barrientos has a series of publication about the morphology of condyle and how this growing axis of the condyle changes because of trauma, and how this changes the, the direction of uh, growing, and of course, changes the orthopedic position of the mandible, muscle activity, and so on. So this was her change day condition. But what I want to show to you is that I started her treatment she had some difference between right and left masseters. This is the, the, the compression test 
I had published with Dr. Loretta, I'm not sure, I think it was in 2011. Uh, the, the, less, this, the left, the left part of the, 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 of the recording is the occlusion, the, the natural bites of the patient over the back teeth. Then right cotton roll, left cotton roll, and cotton roll of both sides. As you can see, it improves. Well, velocity of movement, amount of opening, not bad. Chewing pattern, problem at the right side, problem at the left side. But what I want to show is this. She was in treatment. I was using uh, orthotic in her case. And I did some changing in her orthotic before uh, uh, a trip to the United States. I don't do that anymore because you do something and travel this the day after something goes wrong, the patient tries to reach you and you are in another country. It was crazy. Anyway, this was her situation in the first control of treatment. And I did some small changes because uh, we call that calibration of the orthotic. And that end up with this situation here. As you can see, the masseter, the right masseter, working a little bit more than the left masseter. And the temporalis with uh, also a difference between them, being the, the right a little bit more than the left in terms of recruitment. This was her initial imaging I had. And this was, uh, oh, sorry. The left one, the initial, the MRI. And this was a computed tomograph, not convinced tomograph. Remember when I talked about 1994, when my father bought the T-scan? He bought the T-scan and the CONCAT, the, let's say the ancestor of the ICAT, one of the most popular CONBIN CAT scan that we have now. The ancestor, the forefather of the CONCAT was this, or the, of the ICAT was this CONCAT. This is the CONCAT image you're seeing here. So I was having some trouble with her. She was having some, some, some pain, even with the orthotic. So I did that, I, I changed a little bit the orthotic travel. She started having pain, got crazy, couldn't reach me. When I came back, uh, I, I, I called her. I had this uh, uh, tomography machine in, in, in my, my office. Now I have ICAT, a convin tomograph. I did, of course, I'm comparing convin tomography to MRI. It's not actually the best way to compare it, but remember that I did this at the moment she arrived for a follow-up visit. And she is using the orthotic with, uh, during this, the, the, the recording. Long story short, when you over, uh, how say that, superimpose the, this image, you end up seeing that at the left side, even with the orthotic, there's a little bit shift to the posterior aspect. Also, we could see this in, a, in, in this study here. This is a, a deprogrammation study. The patient is pulsed by tens and using, connected it with a jaw tracking machine. I can see the rest position in the frontal view and the pathway to closure. At the left second, just one millimeter to occlusion, there is a shift to the left. The same thing we see here. Compared to the, the initial situation, with the orthotic, I could have the condyle a little bit more downwards, decompressed, but a little bit backwards at the left side, something that I didn't want to happen. But when I measured, her occlusion was, from an orthopedic point of view, to the left, to where it should be. It should be here, and was basically 0.5 millimeter to the left. 0.5 millimeter to the left. So I grabbed the orthotic, did some adjustment with T-scan, and did this EMG recording immediately after the adjustment. 63, 63, 57, or oh, 50, 57, 57. Imagine that, 0.5 millimeter that I found that in the T-scan that was problematic. What is the T-scan? Oh, 
I don't know what happened to the slide of the T-scan. It was supposed to be here. <laughs> Anyways, I was with this T-scan. I, I made her by the T-scan, found the point, 0.5 millimeters, on the orthotic, adjusted, went back, give the, the orthotic back to her mouth, back to EMG, and that was the balance you saw. This ab absolutely the same right and left, right and left. After this, that is the level of sensitivity of the teeth in terms of motor response. 0.5 adjustment. Over the orthotic, the teeth is under the orthotic. And even like that, it could read this 0.5 millimeter correction and allow the muscle to fire properly and balance each other, just to have an example. I don't know if we have time, but I have more case here, but I think Nick has something to show, right? Nick? Oh, try me now. You got me now? Yes, yes. Sorry. Was this in centric closure when you made those adjustments or was it yeah, an just, excursive? Just uh, let, let's not use the centric in that moment. Just bite as the patient usually bites over right. her back. And that's Your it. habitual closure. So this I was. Think a... I have this. I'm going to look for. I don't know why it was not in the, in the slides. Let me see if I have this apart. Oh, I, I do have, but it's a mess. <laughs> you can see, Nick, that is a very old recording. In this case, I think it's from 2006 or seven or something like that. You can check it. But let me share I, these here. Okay, old man. <laughs> uh, where are you? Here. As you can see, uh, uh, then something changed the, the, can you see my screen? Yep, it's all good. Something bothered my, 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 my disrupted my PowerPoint presentation. Anyway, I was looking for, uh, for a specific point. I think it was this one at the, the, the right side here. I changed it and I got what you saw in the, in the MRI. Oh, in the EMG, right? Uh, balance side to side. I don't know why the, the point point broke my presentation, but anyway, okay. there is another case here from beginning to the end with the teeth coming position. If if you wanna see it, and in English. <laughs> but say say what I was about to say. It's just. It's amazing what we can do when we can measure and how, you know, the stuff that you're doing is so far above. I mean, I, I do some of this myself, but not quite to your level. And it's like, I, I want a general dentist who's out in the audience. We probably don't have a lot of GPs out there right now that aren't TMD or facial pain oriented, but it just, if a GP could realize this kind of stuff exists and this kind of technology can make that much of a difference, you know, it's, that's, that's the goal. That's what we need to get out there. I think that if we end up this uh, this webinar and people uh, see that perspective, enjoy that that's the word enjoy mm -hmm. enjoy that perspective, the teeth as a sensory organ and a mastication unit. <laughs> yeah, I when think we successful in this presentation if we could give them that insight. Yeah, you know, and I. I I guess we're probably, we're almost an hour and a half into it. So we probably should close pretty quick, but I just want to make, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your time and for everybody else's time. And secondly, I'd like to state that Marcel and I will be doing more of these on different topics. Today was kind of a T-scan oriented, T-scan centric one, but we're going to be talking about other things like the electromyography, the joint vibration, the mastication analysis, all these types of deals. So um, we also have other 
other cases planned, other uh, webinars planned. And one in particular that I'm really looking forward to, which will probably be the next one, um, Mark Piper is gonna be coming online, the CMJ surgeon, with a tool out of India. A tool's a radiologist that some of us know. Uh, he just wrote a paper uh, trying to compare Mark's uh, measurements over the last 30 years with his TMJ subjects. And that, that's an amazing landmark paper. And for those of you who haven't seen the paper, uh, John Radke, uh, he, he has a open access online journal, Advanced Dental Technologies and Techniques. Advanced Dental Technologies and Techniques. So John Radke is the founder of BioResearch. He's the engineer that created most of the biopack. So Google it, go look up the paper, and you'll see one on radiology. That's going to be the topic of the next webinar. And Marcelo and I will likely come back here next month sometime. And we're going to do a, I don't know, what do you want to do next time, Marcelo? What do you want to talk about? Well, you name it. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's make it a surprise. So um, I, have, I have this case here. If I have like five minutes. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, think about this case here. A patient with a lot of pain, migraine, ear age, uh, to a debilitating level. She did all this kind of therapy without success. Physical therapy, massage, sugar, points injection, dry needling, acupuncture, uh, various type of splinting, orthotic, and she ended up doing disc surgery. And this was her face before the surgery. This after, how she came to me. And this was her bite. How to manage that bite? Was I it disc repair or was it discectomy? What they do when you say uh, it was disc repair, discopexy it is called. I'm gonna show that. So you can see that's that uneven open bite, and this was her uh, chin day from a MRI perspective. If we can see the the 2015. Is it from 2000? Actually, I was with her today earlier. She is from the, the, the other side of, of Brazil. She, she travels about six hours by plane to, to come to here. <laughs> a flying patient, like you, you, you say it in, in English, right? Mm -hmm. Flying. So what you see here is a very damaged joint. You can see, can you see my, 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 my arrow, the, the right arrow? Yes. Okay, this is the condyle. This is the cortical bone. Actually, this is... We, the cardio bone is what we are not seeing because the black here is the absence of signal of the MRI. But anyway, this is the cortical bone. This is the bone marrow of the condyle. This is the ear. This is the, the, the articular fossa. And this here was the remaining tissue of the disc. And this here is the anchor that was used to keep the disc in place, directly to repair the disc. But my tech was it a my tech anchor? My tech anchor. Uh, two years, I think, after the surgery, the disc was displaced again, as you can see. This is the right side. Uh, direita is right in Portuguese. And this is the disc right here, completely displaced. This is the other side, the left. This bird beak, this resorption, severe resorption of the condyle. You can see here. The disc completely displaced and completely destroyed. The tissue is completely damaged. In the cone beam tomography, another a cone beam tomography, not a uh, old cat, a cone cat, a pluridirectional tomography, but a uh, cone beam tomography, you can see the difference between the right and the left, the position of the anchor. And you know what? This anchor is very close to the top part of the condyle, but original. Originally, it was the same distance as this one here. The problem is that the resorption of the condyle make the condyle shorter. That's why the shift of the minimal is not, uh, to, the, to the, the rotation of the minimal is not even. There is a little shift to the left because it's like a table with a small leg. Well, could this allow uh, occlusion to be stable? Of course not. This was her movement pattern during opening and closing and closure. This is 
opening and closing three times. If we zoom it, you're going to see that the pattern of the movement is very irregular. This, is, this means lack of coordination because the temporalis is having a lot of trouble to make this minimal travel, considering that the condyle has a very ugly surface to function in terms of biomechanical and in terms of comfort, neurological comfort, nociception and proprioception. So look to the velocity of movement. It's very typical that patient we have that kind of damage, uh, had trouble to, to develop velocity during the movement. It's like a rheumatic person trying to walk. Mastigation analysis, right side, left side, very, very uh, pathological pattern. The, the jaw tracker moved a little bit here, but anyways, very, very pathologic case. Look at her occlusion. This is this first column is rest. This green column is opening. So you can see right and left digastric working. The yellow one is maximal occlusion. I ask the patient to bite strongly over the back teeth, keep it, uh, clench hard, 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 relax. So as you can see, yellow, right and left temporalis, blue right and left masseter. If you see this yellow column here, the masseter, the right masseter, basically cannot fire. The left one fire less than the temporalis. The right temporalis fires much more than the, the masseter. But the masseter was supposed to be the one to, to recruit more fibers. The temporalis is more of um, final motor coordination. It's very easy to understand that with a joint, with that damage, the muscle is going to be very... Uh, uh, compromise. And you know what? This means that these muscles are firing much lower than it should be. And this gives a trouble. This is the, the, the trouble because it, with less recruitment, there is less blood, blood and less oxygen and more pain. And during that cultural, I would expect this red and yellow and this last one to show muscle fighting much more just like the other case i showed but this was not happening so that means there was something going on beyond the chmj and that was this is the thermal imaging showing the lack of heat of the masseter because the lack of blood because the lack of recruitment and this is the kind of patient that comes with facial pain and people try to, apply to, to inject Botox. If the problem was a muscle firing too much, I agree, Botox is a tool. We, cannot, we can use the tool if that's the problem. But the problem is the muscle is firing too low. It's a hypofunction of this muscle. Doing clenching, I'm not talking DTR. In DTR you're doing exclusive movements. So during excursive movement, you don't want to the, the muscle to fire too much, but this is clenching. You want the muscle to fire it too much because it's the moment you are, for example, breaking down more to the point of smashing, to make it a pure, <laughs> to, to destroy the almond between your teeth. You need strength. Strength needs muscle recruitment and her muscle can't recruit, cannot have a nice bullet flow, gonna have hypoxy, gonna make trigger points, and gonna, any treatment that try to, to control this without address the proper source of the problem, the joint in this case, and something that's going on that's making the, 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 the muscle even more unable to recruit, and that was beyond the change age. As you can see, the thermal image of the back showing unbalance. It's uneven the heat because not only the ChMJ are working in an unbalanced way, but also the muscle that support the head and support the minimal are working in an improper way. But this was the real problem behind the ChMJ. This is glucose and insulin curve over 
almost uh, over four hours. As you can see, she starts in 20. The up limit of the insulin is 24, but actually anything over six is not good. Insulin is the, the most pro-inflammatory hormone in our body. So her insulin level was not, oh, her, her glucose level was not bad, but you know what? She drank a, a, a I'll call that uh, a glass of orange juice, uh, water, uh, uh, glucose juice, 75 grams of glucose. It was supposed to go much higher than that, but it goes only to 126, and it stays very high, even considering that the body is producing a lot of insulin, trying to take the, 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 the glucose out of the blood but is unable to take the, blood out, the, the, the glucose off of the blood. And the, the glucose stays a little bit higher for a longer period. And the body starts to produce more and more insulin to the point of failure. And finally, she was able to take the, the, the sugar, the glucose, out of the blood into the, the, the muscle, brain, liver, and so on. But you know what? She had a very low level, 58. This is a, a hypoglycemia. And here comes the problem. With, imagine, what is the basic source of energy for the muscle? Glycogen, out of glucose. And she has problem to store, to use, and to store again glucose. It means it, this is a car without gasoline. The car is supposed to, 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 to run on gasoline and someone put some, something else in the tank. This muscle cannot fire properly and it cannot work properly because from a metabolic point of view, she is unable to store properly the energy inside the muscle to make the muscle uh, fire properly. So this was supposed to look like this glucose insulin. For, for a patient like that, what do you think happens if you try to control the case with orthotic, with a, a, a trigger point injection? You are hitting, you, you are touching the surface of the problem. So I sent her to a, a physician friend of mine who starts to work on her hormones, uh, function of her internal organs like a uh, Liver, punk, uh, how come pancreas in English? I'm not sure. Pancreas. Pancreas, okay, pancreas. And so on. Inflammation, the link between insulin resistance, obesity, and diabetes. So this is the kind of patient that one try to work on a case and the failure is just there to bother us. So what I did, this is what happens to, to fat when insulin act, uh, takes place to force the fat cells, the adipocytes, to store the excessive sugar in the blood and produce inflammation and throws this inflammation direct in the bloodstream. So she had to change her lifestyle. She did a lot of supplementation. She did a, a hormone treatment. She did a lot of stuff. And eight months later, she came to me so I could start her treatment. Now I had the biological terrain ready to start my TMJ treatment. She had to change her diet. And she sent this picture because there is a part of the year, there's a, a very big party in Brazil. And she was saying here, my diet's gone. <laughs> but okay, she, she, she can't ab abuse her diet too much because she, her inflammation was too high and she gets in a, in a pain state that's unbelievable. And to change that, not only her had to do that, but her family, she could not have good habits, good diets, if her husband in, in the house would be eating junk food all the time. So the, the, the idea of get right, nice food, right, in shape, and, uh, 
correct the, 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 the diet, it was all over the family. And this, for some, may be craziness, <laughs> but this crazy, unbelievable, orthodox is what her needed. How I get to this height of orthotic is not on the, on the top right now. We don't have time to go deep in this. It's not always I use orthotic like that. But remember that she lost part of the height of the condyle. She had deformity on her uh, articular fossa. He, she had uh, uh, the loss of the height of the disc because the disc is no longer between the condyle and the fossa in the eminence. And she had that she had that open bite. So you put all this together, and you have a a very incredible orthopedic problem in terms of loss of vertical dimension. But take a look what happened to her muscle on correct diet and the vertical dimension. Actually, three dimensional dimension. The muscle are now fighting much much better. Six eight. Here, I think it was something like 19 or something like that. 78, 59, 130, 103. Of course, I, I would prefer the masses to, to fire, fire a little bit more than temporalis, but man. Compared to where it was. Had, yeah. She had a destroyed joint. This is that, that, that test again. So you can see that could improve a little bit here. 70, 72, 81, and so on. She was improving. See the velocity. See the pattern of the movement. There are problems in this, in, this, in this reading here, but much better than the beginning. If you zoom the, the, the graphic, the, the graph, you're going to see that the pattern of the movement is not, no more like it was before with all those, those jerky movements trying to, to get your occlusion. But you know what? This zoomed view, we can see that she was occluding in different points. And this gonna give some trouble to her temporalis to correct that. And so she started to have more pain and more uh, greeting on her tonic. She was greeting over her tonic. So I grabbed my T-scan, my audio unit combined with EMG, you can see the, the, the temporalis firing more. I suppress some of the, the other contacts through the, the configuration. And I found those contact points that I, I need to refine. Find occlusion adjustment. And I did it. It got better, not perfect, but much better. And look to the points of occlusion. Now, almost perfect. Yeah, very small point. That means that the mandible closes and just close. Don't need to adjust many times during closure. Compared to that, close here, 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 in a very big area for the sagittal view, in a big area in a frontal view, and after that, very small, less temporalis work, but better chewing cycle, still with a problem. Sorry, there's some, some environment noise here right now. A lot of trouble here, oh, but much less than the beginning. And that impacts her balance too. She is over a platform. This is uh, initial, and these are control. The right one is the control one. As you can see, remember the thermal image, she was contracting the, the right side of the back in a different pattern of the left side. And this reflects on the loads over her feet and much better controlled here. Besides with the correction of the heights of the mandible and the, the sagittal position, uh, she, ha she has now a much forward uh, mandible. So uh, she has more airway uh, to deal with the air intake in better position. Look to her balance. She was having an oscillation of almost 6.6 .6 centimeters. And then after it, 0.8 centimeters, 0.8 from 6 to 0.8. The, gr the, 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 the graph here 
See, it's big, but it's not in proportion to the other. It just fits the screen. As you can see over her feet. And this is the distance she travels almost. If she finds a direct flight, it would be five hours and a half to get from the Amazon forest <laughs> to Salvador, my city. She is in a city called Porto Velho. And that she uh, happy and well, in a case that, like this, we don't expect too much of recovery of the joint, just stabilization so we can work on occlusion. Now she's stable enough to work on occlusion from a cosmetic point of view. I showed, I think, in some other conference cases like that, but the, the dental work done after that, but that was not the point. That was, the idea was to show how I use the T-scan to get this final adjustment from the biomechanical and neurological point of view, the, to balance the occlusion up to the situation, to the status of the joint. I hope you have enjoyed this case. Oh yeah, Marcelo, uh, I've got an idea for another webinar. What, what about we talk about T-scan and how it correlates with the stabilometry, the, uh, the mask and all that. That'd be interesting. I don't think uh, anyone, very few people are using those technologies. What do you think? Would be great. Yeah. Uh, I like that. That's the idea, it's very interesting. You know, right. TechScan has, has a, a Sway platform also. Yeah. Well, uh, which one do you, the, what do you use? What, what, what are you I using? I use a French one called uh, Footwork. Okay. And T-Scan or TechScan has the math scan, I believe. The math scan, that's, that's the name, math scan. Yeah, scan. all right. All right. Well, the, the time I, I, I bought mine, T-Scan was not selling it in Brazil, was not uh, registered here in Brazil to buy. So I, yeah. I, I bought this French one. You know, the interesting aspects of the, the, the math scan, just as the T-Scan, you can connect to the EMG unit. So you can control, for example, uh, check the mandibular muscle together with the sway analysis. It would be very fun to do it. Wow. And I don't have those kind of analysis because I don't have the equipment. Don't give Robert Kirsten another idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, thank everybody for, uh, for coming into the meeting and, <laughs> and we'll look forward to doing some more in the future. And Marcelo, thank you. Thank Super you. Appreciate you. Uh, any questions you may have, info at cnotmj.com, and we'll get them to Marcelo. Info at cnotmj.com.